why is it that we can't, you know, if this disease is so terrible, why can't we tell with a single arm trial where we just give people treatment that the medicine works? Right, yeah. So, so first off, uh, you know, placebo, uh, actually what patients will get will be best available standard of care. So fluid replacement, uh, electrolytes, uh, support with blood products whenever that's possible. So it's really not placebo per se, but it's the best available standard of care that patients would receive in a clinical trial. And then the question is if... And, and how well does that work? Well, there's increasing uh, uh, information that in fact supportive care can improve outcomes considerably in patients with Ebola virus disease. Uh, a New England Journal of Medicine uh, perspective piece written by docs that are out there in the field uh, you know, have talked about uh, the impact of supportive care. So if we look too at the uh, patients you know, who've come back to either the United States or Western Europe, we've also seen some of the benefits that you know, providing uh, you know, quality supportive care can bring to patients with Ebola. So you, you can see how if you have a clinical trial where you're improving supportive care over what's already available, first of all, that should be helpful to patients. Secondly, it may improve outcomes just from supportive care alone. So it'll be very important to be able to discern the effect of a drug given all these other changing factors that are going on. And we also know too that in clinical trials, the clinical trial population is oftentimes different than the overall population. What you're saying is that the patients in the clinical trial may be healthier than the people who are dying in the streets. Yeah, that, that, that's, we've seen that in a variety of different areas. And if you think about what's involved in getting a patient in a clinical trial, you know, the, the healthcare provider's decision to get a patient in a trial, it's quite likely that those patients will, in general, fare better. So it's really important to have a control group that allows you to interpret properly whether the drug is helping or hurting. Okay, I see that argument on drugs, but Luciano, what about vaccines? Yeah, so the Luciano. Same same really applies for vaccines, you know, it's critically important to, to determine as fast as we can whether these vaccines are safe and effective in controlling Ebola. Today we see, for example, cases in Liberia, the number of cases are going down. Had we deployed vaccine broadly a few months ago, we would have attributed the decreases in cases to vaccine, when in fact it may have been for, for other reasons. So, you know, it's important to be able to establish the effectiveness of these products. We have limited supply of these the vaccines, and it is really imperative to be able to use those limited supply of, of vaccine doses in a way that will allow us to learn whether they're safe and effective for this outbreak and for generations to come, because future outbreaks will occur for sure. Now, another question, do we have enough patients to test all these drugs? It does seem like Drugs and vaccines have come out of the woodwork here. I know there's a big population, but can we enroll enough patients to do all these studies? And if not, how do we pick which drugs get tested? Right, so it will take, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of patients with Ebola virus disease. The uh, thing that will need to happen in the coming uh, uh, weeks, and a lot of this is already going on through uh, colleagues at the National Institutes of Health, will be establishing the capacity to perform the clinical trials so that uh, you know, uh, both here in the United States where there you know, may be a few additional cases over the coming months, but then also in West Africa uh, and affected regions that those capacities for clinical trials are in place and you know, patients there can have both access to the drugs through these clinical trials that are properly designed and also allow us to draw conclusions about which drugs are providing benefit. Then those drugs can be made available to patients thereafter more broadly and uh, you know, they'll be able to have beneficial effects for uh, folks with Ebola virus disease. Luciana, how, I mean, beyond Ebola, how worried do we have to be about other zoogenic diseases? I mean, are we gonna be seeing these kinds of things happen more often, yeah, both so for our own healthcare system yeah. and the world? This is something that Ed and I actually talk quite a bit about because you know, ultimately his staff is really responsible for reviewing drugs for emerging pathogens for for he has the whole antimicrobial portfolio at FDA and you know this is the new normal it's not going to go away we see we keep seeing now you know one infectious disease emerge after another the pipeline of products that the US government supports continues to grow and FDA you know works very closely with our sister institutions to support this pipeline of products 
So clearly the demands to be able to respond for these emergent infections in a very nimble, facile way are critical and are going to continue forever. Does anyone out there want to ask these guys anything? No, excuse oh, here, me. Here's the microphone coming. In, so, a clinic, in a normal clinical trial, are the patients above average? So what we oftentimes see in a clinical trial is the patients that get into the clinical trial generally do better than the overall population. Even if you look at and try and match patients on a number of different factors that you either think or know affect disease outcomes, the patient population in the clinical trials, if we look at them over time, they generally do better. Then that's one of the real challenges here in trying to use anything except a, a, a controlled trial where you can discern those differences that are derived from who gets in a trial. Yeah, so yeah, in a clinical trial, oftentimes, uh, you know, particularly in the setting of uh, a disease like Ebola virus disease, the standard of supportive well, care should yes, improve. Right, yes. Ed? Yeah. The answer is yes, right, The answer is yes. So it's, it's who gets in a trial, it's the care that they might receive in a trial, and you know, it's, it, it, that can impact upon how these patients do, and I mean, that's if, important. If you think about a trial, you think about a drug, a lar about GlaxoSmithKline coming in to do a trial, those are going to be resources that some of these patients would never have had. Yeah, that's quite possible that the trial will bring new levels of care, and that, that's beneficial to patients, but it also makes it important to have a control group to be able to interpret that. And, and if you think about it, too, I mean, it's really important to get the answer right. Because if you don't get the answer right initially, you think something's effective, but it wasn't really the drug. It was the supportive care that changed things. You sort of set a foundation that is a very it's an erroneous foundation, and, and that can cause harm to patients and make it difficult thereafter for further drugs to be developed. So it's really, really important to get it right, right from the start. And, and anybody, we got another one? Jonathan. So, guys, it seems to me that when we give people the standard of care, they actually mostly live, right? You give somebody the six liters of fluids that they're blasting out of themselves a day for long enough, then we win and, and Ebola loses. So one, that's an interesting research problem because you want to invent a drug, but you don't want to kill people who show up for the standard of care. But two, how does the administration feel about the fact, how does the administration feel about making sure that the 18,000, maybe next week 20,000 people who are getting this disease, like we know how to give them ringers lactate, like we know how to give them the standard of care. It's actually not very expensive per person. Is there a feeling in the administration that maybe we should just like get on this over there, uh, whether as humans or as protectors of ourselves? So why fund all these clinical trials anyway, I think was the question there. Just give everybody's best supportive care. Well, so I, so I, I think, think that's it's more really you. critical. It's really, really Luciana, critical. Luciana, can yes. you move the mic yes. closer? No, so, so that's a very important point. I mean, it's really critical to be able to improve the level of care that we deliver to patients globally. Uh, I think it's something that is on the president's agenda for global health security. Uh, and, but, but the reality is that delivering care to patients in those settings are extraordinarily challenging. And we've been you know, meeting with physicians and clinicians taking care of patients in those settings. I mean, they have to, to, to don PPE in, in a personal protective equipment in tremendous heat, uh, two hours at a time. At nighttime, there's no electricity, so it's quite impossible to deliver care safely. So, you know, it, it is just a fact that for the foreseeable future, uh, this is going to be one of the most biggest challenges to be able to improve the quality of care delivered in countries where the healthcare system is so... Um, so weak. Do we have one more out there? Yeah? yeah. yeah All right. Name, my name is, is Dan Salazar. Shout. My name is Dan Salazar. I, I wonder if the whole strategy, though, is geared towards Western type of medicine. You know, we're talking about clinical trials and placebos and all that stuff. To me, it's what can be sustainable, real-world effectiveness in these very impoverished nations. They're, it's going to be so hard for them to have even maintain Western standards of care. 
And so I, I would like to hear our, our panelists talk about that. Have you thought about what's real world effectiveness in that region? To me, I don't see much choice besides having broad-based vaccines to really be effective in the long run. After the fact, interventions with, you know, IV, massive IV infusions and all those things are not going to be economically sustainable there. So should we be doing anything but just vaccines? So, well, clearly vaccines is you know, critic, you know, a huge importance, which is why a lot of the focus has been on conducting the clinical trials for vaccines. But it's also important to, to realize that some of the neighboring countries to the affected countries have over time built tremendous capacity, laboratory capacity, clinical trial infrastructure capacity, which didn't exist maybe 10, 20 years ago. So I think it's important for us, and we are working very closely today with the government of Liberia to build that capacity in Liberia. They are going to have a clinical trial infrastructure because of the vaccine studies, because of the therapeutic studies that didn't exist before this epidemic. So again, I think it's, you know, we have to do all we can, and the U.S. leadership in this is critical because it won't happen without U.S. leadership to be able to build the capacities in these countries to be able to respond effectively to future epidemics. Again, it's not going to be the last one, and they can't be left out. All right, do we want to take one more, or do you guys want to close it up? Um, have you guys in, been employing remote uh, monitoring for the patients to decrease transmission? You need, you, you need to shout. <laughs> <laughs> have you been employing remote monitoring in order to, uh, you know, monitor these patients a little bit more effectively without uh, contamination risk? Does remote monitoring play a role in these clinical trials, Ed? Yeah, so at this point, I mean, you, you know, the, the real challenge is, is you know, trying to get information and be able to do the assessments that you need to do in the setting of, you know, the isolation that's necessary. Uh, as far as remote monitoring, I haven't heard people talk about that so far. But there have been discussions about different types of technologies that can be utilized in order to get the information that you're uh, gathering as you're seeing patients out of the hot area and to the area where you know, the information can be further, the data can be further processed. So it, it's, it's akin to what you're talking about, but not quite the same, because it sounds like you're actually talking about sort of real-time monitoring and such. Yeah, I'm so. talking about, you know, a HIPAA-compliant form of FaceTime, for instance, yeah. something where you can do real-time monitoring of the patients and get, you know, minute-to-minute -minute data. Right. Or and the it, phones they used in Nigeria to track the Ebola patients, where they, were, they had real-time alerts of when people got fevers. Yeah, so I mean, there may be a way to use technology, and certainly if you could do, and I'm thinking of the patient who's sick and in the Ebola treatment unit, I mean, if you could gather such information, it, it may help to... Uh, better monitor patients, give better data in real time, it could be helpful. I just don't know that it's there just yet, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. 